place, at the right time, right now. You can be seated this morning. We appreciate all of you being here and um, looking forward to what the Lord is going to do in this house today. We welcome all of you. And we're glad you're here. Uh, we are starting a new series, and we're talking about what is Christmas, because that's always the question. What is Christmas? And so I want to read a verse of scripture that really kind of gives us and defines Christmas. It's in Matthew chapter 1. And I'm going to read a few verses of scripture there. It said, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? Which means God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him, and he took uh, Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate the marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. So when we read the scripture, and when you read other scriptures in the Bible, you'll find that God never intended to conceal the reality that God was being born into the world. And I don't suppose any of us really can even fathom what it means for God to be born in a manger. And how do you explain the Almighty, I mean the Almighty God stooping down and becoming a tiny infant? Our minds cannot even begin to understand what it involves God becoming a man. Nor can we explain how God could become a baby, yet the scripture tells us that without forsaking his divine nature or diminishing his deity, he was born in the world as a tiny infant. The Bible says he became flesh. When you become flesh, God was accepting all the limitations of a human being. He became vulnerable to human weaknesses, just like you and I are. Physical weaknesses, weariness, pain, emotional trauma, sorrow, loneliness, but he did it without sinning. He was fully man and fully God. And yet people throughout the centuries have tried to diminish the incarnation of God, that Jesus Christ came, God in the flesh. Let me read you one more scripture and then we're gonna dive right into this message. And I believe the Lord will really help us with this. In Romans chapter 15, verse 12, it says, and in another place Isaiah said, the heir to David's throne will come and he will rule over the Gentiles and they will place their hope on him. I'm going to read that again. They will place their hope on him. I pray that God, the source of hope, will fill you completely with joy and peace because you trust in him. Then you will overflow with confident hope not a questionable hope, but a confident hope through the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you that your word is true, that your word is powerful, that your word is relevant in 2023, that it applies to every facet of our lives. God, your word has the answer. Your word is the hope for mankind. So I pray today that you would remove every distraction, open our heart, open our spirit, to your word today. Lord, help us to give you our 100% undivided attention. I pray for the anointing of your spirit and let the people hear the voice behind the voice in Jesus' name. And everyone said, so how many here could use a little bit of hope today? And the Bible says that God is our source of hope. And so what I want to bring out today is Christmas is hope. When we think of Christmas, you may not think of that, but really, it is hope for mankind, for all of us. Sometimes, we get a misunderstanding of what hope is. In fact, in our world today, people don't really understand what hope is. I've said it earlier this uh, month. I'll say it again. I'm a hope dealer. I, I deal with hope today. I I'm giving you hope through the Word of God, and you're going to see that God is the very source of our hope. In fact, Romans, the book of Romans, I just read the scripture, it said that God is the God of hope. In other words, when you have this hope in God, he'll fill your life with joy. He'll fill your life with peace. It is a confident hope. 
not a, a wavering hope, but a very confident hope. It's something that I believe uh, uh, even scientists, even doctors say that the human spirit that has hope will keep them alive. There is a movie. How many have ever seen the movie It's a Wonderful Life? Anybody seen that movie? Okay, you people need to watch It's a Wonderful Life. I can't believe all these years. And you guys, oh, I see it. I'm telling you, you got to see the movie. And it comes out every year during Christmas. I've literally have had people over my house and said, we're going to watch this movie. And I go, why, Pastor? Just sit down. We're going to watch this movie. You're going to enjoy this movie. And it has a lot of meaning. And it was done literally, I think, back in the, uh, back in the late 30s, I think, or early 40s when the movie was made. And uh, there's a part in the movie that comes early in the movie, like almost in the beginning, and the movie talks about uh, how, they're, how they're talking in heaven, and Clarence, apparently he's the angel second class, is about to get an assignment to go out and help this guy in trouble. And the superior tells him, you got to go help this guy out named George Bailey. And Clarence says, what is it? Is he sick? And I love the response that he gets. He goes, no, it's worse than that. He's discouraged. What he's saying is because discouragement will lead to lack of hope. He says it's worse than sickness when a man or a woman has no hope. And that is the reality of the life that we live in. People are always asking that question, is there hope? That is the fundamental question today. Is life worth living? Can I count on something? Do I have hope? Thousands and thousands of people ask that question. When you're sitting in a doctor's office and you're hearing the results of the test, is there hope? When you're standing beside someone at the hospital and you're looking at their condition, is there hope? When you're a couple that's going through marriage counseling and you've been going through it over and over again, is there hope? When you're in bankruptcy court, awaiting the decision, is there hope? When a family hears of their son or daughter missing, is there hope? There's a statement that says, you can go 40 days without food and three days without water, and you can go eight minutes without air, but you can't go a single second without hope. I believe hope is the essential part of life today. All of us need hope. And I'll say it this way. You need hope to cope, right? You do, all of us. All of us need some hope. And so discouragement will lead many times to hopelessness. And there's a story that was written by a guy named Major Harold Kushner with his name. And he was a POW in Vietnam. Those of you who don't know what POW, prisoner of war, And he talks about the devastating effect of hopelessness on a human being. And he described one 24-year-old American Marine who was a POW in Vietnam. He said this Marine decided to cooperate with the Viet Cong who had captured him. He said, if you promise to let me go, I'll do whatever you guys want me to do. And they said, great. So this guy, he said, became a model prisoner. He cooperated with everything in the prison. He even helped uh, other people in the camp. But after a while, it became clear to him that the Vietnamese were lying to him. They were going to let him go. And that's when the realization took place. And how Major Kushner described it is that this Marine became a zombie, He refused to do any work. He rejected all offers of food and encouragement. He simply lay in his cot, sucking his thumb. In a matter of weeks, he was dead. And he said, I would guess if there was one word uh, that would cause, that caused the death of this young Marine, it was hopelessness. He said, in fact, doctors in World War II and in Korea and in Vietnam said some prisoners die from the condition of what we call give up itis. And what that, meant, what that meant, that if a prisoner is faced with grim conditions 
and no prospect of freedom. And some become demoralized. They become mired in despair. And after a while, they become apathetic. They refuse to, to eat, uh, to have food. They refuse drink. And they spend their time in their bunk, staring in space. With their hope drained away, these prisoners eventually just waste away and die. They die of give up itis. So the human spirit needs hope to survive and to thrive. All of us today need hope. All of us. They say that doctors, one of the things that they found is when you don't give a patient any hope, you're basically pronouncing a death sentence on that person. What makes the difference in the world that we live in today is that we have a hope. When a man has a hope that said he's capable of bearing incredible burdens and cruel punishment, when hope is gone, people fall apart emotionally, physically, and spiritually. And yet, the Bible tells us early on, it tells us about hope and the necessity of hope. In fact, 2,500 years ago, King Solomon talked about hope. And this is what he said, Proverbs 13, 12, and a lot of us have experienced this. It says, hope deferred makes the heart sick. It says, and a longing fulfilled is the tree of life. How many have ever had your hope deferred? You were hoping for something, and it didn't come to pass. Another translation said that this way, when hope is crushed, the heart is crushed. But a wish come true fills you with joy. If you ever had your heart set on something, you were wishing for something, you were longing for something, and then it didn't happen, it crushed your heart and knocked the wind right out of you. I remember as a kid, I always wanted a dog, always asking for my, guess what, I never got the dog. Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And so when my kids wanted a dog, I said, you don't get a dog, I didn't get a dog, you don't get a dog either. <laughs> Hope deferred makes the heart sick. Yeah, you got to feel a little bit of what I felt in life. It'll, it's good for you. It'll build character in you. <laughs> now, I, I told him, hey, if you can find me a dog that cleans up after himself and feeds himself, I want that dog. Give me that dog. I go, but if, if I get you a dog, I'm going to be the guy cleaning up the mess. I'm going to be the maintenance guy. Forget the dog. Anyway, Romans chapter 15 says, he is the God of hope. In other words, putting our hope in God. Did you know that there are 95 references in the Old Testament concerning hope? There's also 85 references in the New Testament concerning hope. And so it's woven throughout the scriptures that hope is woven there in the Bible. This is why Christmas is about hope, that he is the God of hope. In other words, when you have hope in your life, it keeps you going. Uh, see, there's all this misinterp misinterpretation of what hope is. People don't understand what hope is. People say, well, I hope they have salsa in the cafe today. I hope they make the burritos. I hope they do this, you know. You know, I hope I'm not late to church. I, you know, that, that's how we kind of use hope. Uh, let, me, let me give you uh, the secular definition of hope because the Bible definition is different than the secular world. The Webster Dictionary defines hope with two different things. The Webster de de definition says hope is the feeling of what is wanted or what will happen or what you want to happen. It's a feeling. Another uh, definition is the desire accompanied by expectation. So what weakens the definition of biblical hope is the Bible doesn't talk about hope being a feeling. How many remember that song? Well, maybe it's, you guys are too young, but there used to be that song, feeling, nothing more than feeling. I said, bro, come on, hope defer, makes the heart sick. Trying to forget your... Anyway, here we go. I remember that song. Anyway, feelings, man, could be shallow. How many can say amen to that? They can be shallow. There could be a girl that says, well, I hope my boyfriend gives me a diamond ring for Christmas. <laughs> hope deferred makes the heart sick. <laughs> I hope my football team wins this year. 
If you're a Raider fan, hope deferred makes the heart sick. Desire, right? All these things. Gosh. Man, just, just live in the reality already. Hallelujah. All right? Just because you have hope doesn't mean it's a guarantee. You know, I, I hope this person asked me out for a, a date. Is that a guarantee? It doesn't. I hope I get this job. It's not a guarantee. None of that is. And so all of this, when we start engaging in a wishful thinking, we're wishing this happens. It, it becomes, it's not the hope that the Bible is talking about. There's also this other type of hope, which is kind of blind optimism. In other words, you're, you're just, regardless of what's going on around you, you know, you, you still have this unrealistic hope. They say the Christian science, for instance, say that evil ultimately is an illusion. It's not real. We're just imagining it. Well, I don't know about that. I think we, we're seeing it for what it is. I read this story. I'll read it to you again. It was a, a sign on a bulletin board in a grocery store, and it said, looking for my lost dog. He has three legs, blind in left eye, missing a right ear, tail is broken, and recently been castrated. He answered by the name of Lucky. I don't think that dog's lucky at all. I mean, this, let's be honest. Right, you can say all that you want, and so these these definitions of hope is not the Bible's definition of hope. This is why people fall for scams all the time. They fall for things, you know, uh, tarot card readings and psychic hawk lines and palm readings and crystals and all of this because people are putting their hope in the wrong source. They think that these things are going to give them answer. Can I, can I just tell you, the real, only real hope in your life is God. He's the real hope for your life today. Again, Romans 5.13, may God, the source of hope, fuel you with joy, peace, through your faith in him. In other words, it will overflow in hope. Can you, did you know that you can even put your hope in God's name? God's name has, is the name of hope today. You say, well, how can you put hope in a name? Back in ancient culture, when you named somebody, when you gave names, it meant something. And God's name means something. The Bible says, I'm Jehovah Shalom. Remember, I did a, a series on God's name. He goes, I am the God of peace. If you'll just put your name in Jehovah Shalom, you'll have peace. He said, I'm Jehovah Jireh. I'm the God that provides. I'm Jehovah Shama. I am always there. I am Jehovah, that one that will take care of you. See, God's name, you can trust in his name. He lives up to his name. God's name, Jesus says, is called Emmanuel. God is with us. And so here I want to read you a scripture here that I think all of us can relate to. It's in Hebrews 6.19. It says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul. Firm, secure. It enters the inner sanctuary behind the curtain. So Hope is only as good as what it's attached to. If you've ever gone fishing, if you've ever gone out in a boat, in order to keep that boat uh, stable and you're out fishing, you throw out the anchor. And that anchor has a rope uh, that's attached to it that keeps that boat stable and keeps, keeps it from drifting and moving around. And so basically our hope has the rope and it's connected to God. Our hope is connected to Jesus. And I'm telling you today, if you're riding on that boat of hope, it's not going to sink. It's not going to tip over. You can anchor your life to the boat of hope that Jesus is on. All right, I'm preaching better than you're clapping, but that's okay Hope, hope is an expectation of the promises that God has for you and I. Whatever God promises, you can lean on that hope. How many thank God that God doesn't break promises? People break promises, but God doesn't. You and I can break promises, but God does not. And this is why we can trust in the hope of God's promises. Whatever he promises you, he'll keep it. 
And here's this other point that I want to make, and write this down. I think the greatest benefit of the hope that you and I have with God, listen to this, is the hope that we have with God is that this hope we have is because we're, we've been forgiven of our past. How many thank God that the past is gone? It says this in 1 Peter 1.3, let us thank the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ it was through his loving kindness that we've been born again to a new life. And we have a hope that never dies. This hope is ours because Jesus was raised from the dead. So this verse reminds us of our salvation that God's gift of mercy, God's gift of forgiveness is something we receive. We didn't earn it. We didn't deserve it. But out of his grace, out of his love, he's forgiven you of your past. And so, therefore, you get a second chance. Some of you third, four, 100 chances. Hallelujah. God gives us another chance. Lamentation says it this way. Uh, 321, it says, this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. Because the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for his compassion never fails. They are new every morning. So the Bible is telling us that you can rely on God's forgiveness, and you can rely that God will forgive. See, a lot of us are still, let me just be honest, we're still living in guilt. Some of you live in the guilt like, man, I didn't raise my children right. I didn't. Start my marriage correctly. Uh, I didn't love people the way I did. And, and we live in life many times with all of this guilt. And we say, man, I wish I could have started over. I wish I, I had a fresh start. I wish I didn't make all these mistakes because all of us have failed. All of us have made mistakes. And some of us are still feeling guilty for some of the mistakes that we made. You guys ever see the movie City Slickers? I'm not re recommending it, okay? But anybody ever see that movie, City Slickers? Yeah, some of us have, anyway. Uh, it, it, it's about three guys from New York, and they're kind of middle-aged, and they decide they're going to go out west, and they're going to cattle drive. And as they're doing that, these three guys are kind of connecting, and they're sharing their life. And so one night, they're in the tent, and... And they've been drinking a little bit, and get, they're getting all depressed, and that's how guys are. All of a sudden, their feelings come out when they're drinking. And so, uh, if you want to he hear a truth, just find out what, talk to the drunk. He'll tell you everything that's on his mind. But anyway, he, he's crying, and he, there, he's in a mess. And one of the guys says, uh, what's wrong? And this is what he says. He says, I've committed adultery before this trip. My wife found out, and she's going to leave me. He said, when I get home, she's going to be gone. I don't know if I'm ever going to see my children. And then he said, my boss is my, boss is my wife's dad, so I'm going to lose my job. I'm going to be unemployed. I'm going to be lonely. He said, I'm on a dead end. And then he says, I'm almost 40 years old, and I've wasted my life. He's overwhelmed. And his friends tell him this to try to cheer him up. They said, do you remember when we were kids and we were playing ball? And we hit the ball over the fence, out of bounds. We would yell, do-over? Remember that do-over? And he said, yeah. He goes, it's a do-over. Man, just do a do-over. And I began to think about, well, how are you going to do a do-over without Jesus in your life? See, here's the reality is that God does, and he's the only one that can give us a do-over. He can wipe the slate clean. He can forgive you. How many thank God for his forgiveness and his grace? See, some people need a do-over in their life. Because if we don't, we let, it's like squeezing the toothpaste out of a tube. Guilt has squeezed hope out of your life. When you live in guilt, it'll squeeze every ounce of hope out of your life. I read of this letter of this woman who wrote to her pastor, and this is what she wrote. She said, I was living with this guy, and I got pregnant. I wanted to keep the baby. I wanted to raise the baby, but he didn't want me to, and he was a very controlling type of guy, and he coerced me and, and convinced me that I should have an abortion, so I did. She said, then afterwards, he left me anyway, and for years, I've been miserable. I've been guilty. I'm utterly ashamed of myself for not being strong enough to stand up for myself and stand up for this baby. 
And I begin to think about this woman. You know, guilt lies to all of us. Tells us that we're not qualified to do a do-over. But can I'm telling you today, the mercy and the grace of God, he is the God of forgiveness. He is the God to give this mercy. And then she wrote this letter to her pastor. She said, uh, uh, she said uh, right before, she, because she became a Christian and she got baptized and she goes, I can't thank God enough for all the grace that I received. And at her baptism, she stood up. She said, God gave me a do-over. Hallelujah. See, if you feel weighed down with guilt, if you feel weighed down in, you know, feeling like, man, I, I, I've messed up. I've done all this. Why are you carrying all of this when you can have God remove all of that guilt? This is the great thing about having hope in God is that he forgives us. He removes the guilt. He removes all of the things that we've ever done wrong. In fact, 1 John says uh, that he'll forgive us if we confess our sins. Uh, I read that scripture in Lamentations. His mercy is new every morning. Uh, and so I want to just say to you, a lot of us, we're pursuing uh, the wrong, we're pursuing hope in the wrong places. It'll never cure you. It'll never, it, it'll never help you if you bank your hope on money, if you put your hope on people, if you put your hope on things. It'll let you down. How many of us, we put our hope in a person and they let us down? It'll never satisfy you unless you put your hope in God. I said unless you put your hope in God. You know, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. Here's is what I found out. The older I get, the more I realize I don't have control of things. The faster you learn that, the more you'll start putting your hope in God. Because all of us are control freaks. We try to control everything. It's true. We, try, we think we can maintain this and maintain and then, and then And then when we try to control it even more, you lose more control. You ever try controlling your kids? See how quick they run off on you. Oh, that's another sermon right there. <laughs> Trying to control people, actually, you lose control. And so a lot of us, we're trying to control everything. We're trying to do this, trying to do that. And, we, and we're putting our hope in the wrong thing. We're putting our hope in the wrong people, in the wrong sources. It's not God. I was reading the story of this atheist the Bible says, the fool, a, a, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. And this atheist said, for the first 30 years of my life, I was an atheist, he said. He said, I remember so many times waking up in the middle of the night, and it was all black. And I looked into the blackness, and I could feel my soul blackened. And he said to himself, if I die, Everything I have is buried in the casket. Is that it? He said, I can't believe it. And he made this statement, one out of every six Americans believe there is nothing after life. How hopeless is that? There's a lot of people today just like this guy. They feel hopeless. They feel like you know, they don't put their trust in God. Some of them don't even believe in God. Some of them don't even put their trust in God. Could you imagine what kind of future? Man, you don't, you don't even have any hope for the future because you don't believe in there's a God. I want to show you this video. And uh, this is actually a, a video of a plane crash that happened in 1989. And I want to show you a, 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 just a, a real clip a quick clip of this tra crash, and I'll tell you a little bit about it in just a moment. Go ahead and show that clip. Sioux City, Iowa. A mechanical problem has wiped out this airplane steering and control system, leaving pilots Al Haynes and Bill Records with no way to safely land. And we began to experiment and find out that, that we could not fly under conditions. The only way we could fly it was by using the controls. So what we had was it would be like trying to bring a car down at high speed with no steering and try to make it do what you want to do by opening the door on one side and opening the door on the other side to force it to turn. The impact is terrifying. The only recollection I have an entire incident is a sound. Push. With no brakes, the aircraft 
hits the pavement at full speed. The wing barely catches on the ground, causing the plane to skid off the runway and explode in flames. In mere moments, all that remains of the fuselage is a smoldering fragment. Rescuers race to the scene. As fire crews douse the flame, workers comb the adjacent fields for survivors. Amazingly, amid all the destruction, there are signs of life. We were literally just jumbled in. Okay, thank you. <laughs> uh, this accident happened in 1989, and miraculously, there was over 100 survivors. Uh, 200 other people died and passed away. And in 1989, when that accident happened, or before that accident happened, there was a computer salesman by the name of Jeff who was on a Colorado trip, or was in Colorado, and he got on this United Airline DC-10 to fly back to Chicago. And said he was reading this paperback book, and he was sitting in the aisle seat, and all of a sudden, there was a bang. And the plane shuddered, so much that the book fell off his hands into the aisle. The tail engine on the three-engine plane had exploded and crippled the steering of that plane. And so they could not control the steering, and so you just have to imagine what they did is just try to control the, the plane with the throttle, trying to throttle. You heard this guy, and they were trying to, they really couldn't steer it. In fact, it was, it was banking right, and they needed to go left, so they said, we just made it go full right, so we can go to the left, to that area, to the left area where the airport was at. Then the plane was going so fast that they said it was way too fast to land the plane, but they had no choice. They finally got into Iowa, and they, they, they were able to, as you can see, land the plane as best that they could. And this guy describes the scene this way. He said there were people that were so scared they were shaking uncontrollably, weeping uncontrollably. Other people had this blind optimism. He said they were just saying, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay, even though it had no effect on the outcome. But this guy, Jeff, had become a Christian. He had been a Christian for several years, and he spent a, a large amount of time on that plane just praying. And his, play, his prayer was this, Thank you, Lord, he said, that you're mine and I'm yours. God, I want to live. I really do. But I know if I don't, I'll be with you and you'll take care of my family. Jeff had a confident expectation that God was willing and able to fulfill his promises. And he would spend eternity with him that God would take care of his family even if he died. And you could see what happened as the plane landed. It exploded. And he said, uh, it, it, the fuselage broke up into several pieces, Jeff said, and I just braced myself for the worst. I figured I was going to die any second, and the piece of the fus fuselage broke off, and I went into the cornfield, and I hung upside down. He found himself strapped into his seat, hanging upside down, and there was not a mark on him. It was incredible. He said, few people, the few people that did live through the airplane crash, there was a feeling of despair. And they asked him, how did you feel? He said, it was scary. But really, he goes, at the time, I was full of hope. I really had this hope that if I was going to die at that moment, I would be in heaven with God forever. I really had this hope, he said, that my family was going to be okay. He said, it's what the book of Psalms says. What can anybody do to you if your hope is in God? Think about that. He knew, or at least he expected, that this plane was going to crash, he's going to die, but somehow this guy was filled with hope. This is the great thing about Christianity, and this is the great thing about God, is that, you know, we don't know what the future holds, but we know who holds the future. 
And we know that no matter what happens to us today in this life, and whether we live tomorrow or the next day, our hope is still with God. And that, you know what? We know where we're going if something happens. Can you say amen? We know where we're going. 1 Corinthians 15, 19, it says, if all our hope is just on this earth, we are just to be pitied. Another version said, and if Christ has not been raised from the dead, then your faith is for nothing. You're still guilty of your sin. And those in Christ who have already died are lost. But if our, if our hope is in Christ, it's only for this life here on earth, then people should feel more sorry for us than for anyone else. But how many know that our hope is not just in this life, but it's in the life to come. It's in trust and knowing that if we die, we're going to be in his presence. We're going to be with God. Jesus said it this way, don't be troubled. You trust in God, now trust in me. I'm going to prepare a place for you. See, the real acid test to hope is how do you look at death? How do you handle funerals? Anybody can be hopeful when things are going great, but what happens when somebody close to you dies? What happens when someone that you really were close to dies? How do you handle funerals? I've been to so many funerals, I can't even remember how many. And I've been to funerals where the families looked hopeless. They were filled with despair. They were filled like, I don't know what I'm going to do now. But then I've been to other funerals, and it's a celebration. Yeah, they're going to miss that person. They're going to miss who they were. But they're not feeling sorry for them. They're feeling sorry for themselves because they're not going to be around. But they're celebrating because they know they're in the great hands of God. They're in the hands of Jesus. They, they know that. First Peter said it this way. God has reserved for his children the priceless gift of eternal life. It is kept in heaven for you. And God in his mighty power will make sure that you get there safely to receive it because you're trusting him. So be glad there's a wonderful joy ahead even though the going is rough while we're down here. Hallelujah. How do you handle what's happening? How do you handle death? How do you ha it's really going to say a lot about where your hope is at. My hope is in God. Hey, I don't want to die, but I know if I die, I know where I'm going. I said, you know, my, my, my concern is my family, not me. I know where my soul is going. I'm going to be in the presence of God. Now, I'm, don't, don't get me wrong. I'm not looking forward to dying anytime soon. But I know what happens when I do. I'm not going to be filled with fear. I'm not going to be afraid because I know where my hope is today. Now, I'm going to show you one more picture here. Why don't, why, don't you, why don't you show this picture right here of this lady? This lady here is looking at a screen because she is legally blind. And she can only see blurs. And so she has to, this was, you know, back in the early 90s. Uh, as you can tell, it's not a flat screen. And she's trying to see her daughter skating. And in the arena right next door, right there, her daughter is skating a beautiful routine. But she can't see it, so she has to look at the screen as close as she can. You can take it down. And the person she's watching, her daughter, is Nancy Kerrigan, who's an Olympic figure skater. And her mom became legally blind by 31 years old, so she never even has ever seen her daughter's face, let alone actually seeing her skating. And they've asked her, what do you see when you watch that TV? She says, I see a bit of color. I see some movement. She gets all choked up. She says, but I can't see my daughter's face. Can I tell you today, when I think about that, I don't know about you, man. I think about the presence of God. I think about who God is in my life. When I gave my life to the Lord, I feel his presence. I feel it in my heart. But I can't wait one day 
to see him face to face. Hallelujah. When we see God face to face, when we're able to look at him and thank him for what he's done. A number of years ago, they were able to help her mom. And after 20 years of not seeing her daughter, she could finally see the face of her daughter. Could you imagine that feeling? I think it's going to be the same feeling when we see Jesus face to face. When all of our things that we've cried about, when all of the things that we wept about, when we said, oh man, what happened? What's all that's going on in my life? Revelation 22, 4 says, and they will see his face and his name will be written on their forehead. We will then be able to say, well, he will wipe away all of their tears. He will wipe away everything. No more death, no more sorrow, and we'll be able to see him face to face. So I pray today that before you leave this place, that you'll have an encounter with God. Let me pray for you. Why don't we bow our heads real quick, close our eyes. Father, reach across this building.